So I, I grabbed a presentation slot after I found out that I, my RubyConf proposal was accepted. So this is like a preview uh, rough draft presentation for what I'm giving next month at RubyConf. So if you're going to RubyConf, sorry, uh, hopefully you'll see it twice. Uh, but well, it's not single tracks, so it's going to one of the other Yeah, you could go to one of the other talks. Uh, but so but one thing to keep in mind is I am looking for like really intense, harsh feedback uh, because I want the talk to be good. Uh, so if you don't understand something or if I talk too fast or say um too much, please tell me, like don't be shy. Um, but let's get started. So what? I said um already? Yeah. Oh, now there's two. So anyway, uh, I said it again. And, uh, so let's get started. Uh, my, t my talk is on Raft. Uh, and a Raft is a consensus algorithm. And I wanted to give, uh, I wanted to teach Rubyists about it. Uh, so most of you guys know me already. Uh, for those who don't, that's my Twitter, pretty much everything else on the internet handle. Uh, that's my last name also. And I work at Bigner Ranch. We do awesome mobile consulting uh, training, and we also have a products division as well. So check us out. Take one of our courses. It's pretty sweet. But to get started, um, before we get into really intense stuff, I wanted to do something that I wanted to go over something that I think everyone understands, which is a pizza party uh, scenario. <laughs> and uh, so there's four people, Tom, Jim, Andy, and Pam, and they're all friends. And every week, they have a pizza party for lunch, just like me. But um, they work remotely, so they're in different offices. Uh, so they use like text messages to schedule the meeting, and it's basically whoever gets hungriest first decides to schedule it. And so uh, let's just go through a scenario of them uh, deciding to get pizza on a Friday. So it's 11 o'clock, and Tom drank a lot last night, so he's like, I need pizza early so I can go to sleep after this. And so he text messages everyone. He's like, I need to go get pizza right now. Uh, go get pizza with me. And so Jim and Andy are like, they're not really doing anything at the office, and they're just kind of slacking off. So they respond really quickly, and they're like, yeah, we'll get pizza with you. But Pam is working really hard, and her boss doesn't want her looking at her cell phone, so she isn't responding yet, and Tom hasn't heard back from her in a while. Um, so in the meantime, uh, Andy and Jim suggest they want to, or sorry, Tom some, suggests to Andy and Jim that he wants to go to Pizza Hut, and... They're like, yeah, sweet. We'll go to Pizza Hut with you. That's awesome. That's my favorite restaurant. And uh, so Tom's like, cool. Uh, confirmed for, for Pizza Hut. I'll meet you guys there in an hour. And then right after that, uh, Pam picks up her phone because uh, she has a five-minute break. And she's like, oh, well, I, now I want to get pizza. And so, so she doesn't see the text message chain that's already happened. And she's really just like, hey, it's Friday. It's time for pizza. Um, and she like wants to initiate that conversation again. Um, and they're like, oh, well, cool. We already like decided on it. Uh, just meet us at Pizza Hut in an hour. Um, so they kind of they just let her know like what's happened while she was gone. Um, and the result is a pizza consensus, and everyone goes to Pizza Hut, and they're really happy. But um, but really, I mean, it, it, you know, it's we kind of do it without even thinking about it. Like as humans, voting or deciding on something is kind of a natural process. Uh, it's it doesn't really seem very technical, but there are a lot of hidden like edge cases and uh, problems that can come up. Um, so just to kind of, uh, I guess, define what, some of the things that we just did, even though and even though this happens like every week in my chat room at work as we decide where to go to for lunch, um, here's some like terms that we can use that are kind of technical. So, so we did leader election, sort of. Uh, Tom was like, hey, let's go to lunch. I'll organize it. Um, and everyone was like, yeah, we'll go to lunch with you. So that was like a hey, we're allowing you to kind of decide or at least manage this lunch choosing activity. Um, we also did, I mean, maybe this, this is kind of silly, but we did state replication. Like, everyone re everyone remembered that we were going to Pizza Hut, and then they also confirmed. So, um, I don't, and like what time and everything, too. So, the, the thing that Tom wanted to do was also like replicated out to the other people, I guess. So, it just sounds weird talking about it with people. Uh, and then also we handled like a really minor, I don't even know if you could call it a partition, but uh, Pam wasn't, wasn't hearing the whole conversation. And as soon as she joined back, uh, she got like, she, she kind of got up to speed really quickly and nothing broke in that process. She didn't get like uh, isolated out or they're like, they're still friends with her and everything. Um, so, so that, I mean, 
it kind of makes sense. It's a little hard to think about uh, this vote, normal voting process that everyone does, but now try to like take that and go write an algorithm with it. And like I guess this is kind of a sarcastic slide. Like it's really hard, right? Like taking these voting procedures and turning it into something computers can understand isn't really easy. Uh, and some of the reasons that it's hard is, well, one, distributing computing is just hard in general. Like getting computers even talking together and doing the right thing and you know, talking in a specific way is really difficult. Uh, and even this, this human consensus problem is also not so straightforward. It, I mean, there can be problems. I mean, look at like the Senate right now or whatever, the, or Congress. But uh, so it, it, these two problems together are even more difficult than, uh, than separate. And what it really comes down to is computers are not very smart. So like we have to tell them exactly what to do. And that's why it's so hard, because we have to handle all of these ed ca edge cases up front. Uh, we can't tell them to be smart, like, hey, but, or, you know, we, like, they're not going to notice when this group of people is making do another decision about lunch. Uh, so we have to, like, kind of bake that into the process and make sure that they don't get stuck anywhere in that decision-making uh, uh, instructions. But we'll come back to this. Uh, I, I think most of you guys already know this. <laughs> But um, the next big question I think you guys are probably thinking is like, why give this at a Ruby meetup? Um, consensus, is, I mean, I don't know if anyone's really writing a consensus algorithm in Ruby. Um, there are a couple, but no, I don't think anyone here uh, is writing one. And Ruby is not really, I mean, some people use it for distributed computing, but it's not really, that's not why it's popular. Um, but I want to change your mind. Um, so. You have, like, maybe you have an app that has a distributed database would be, like, a, a huge case. Uh, or maybe you have, like, multiple app servers or, like, your database is on a separate server than your web application. Or maybe you even just have, like, two dynos on Heroku or something. Um, well, you're using, you're technically working with a distributed system. You might not know it. Uh, it might not be very apparent, but it's distributed. Uh, and so here's an even weirder case that you might have not thought of before, but... Maybe you have multiple clients using your system. And so clients here means like you have more than one browser looking at your at your server. Um, and so that's also technically distributed, right? Oops. Um, you might not require distributed consensus or have some of these problems because maybe your state is just on one server. But um, it's good to think about it like a distributed system because that, that's what it is. Uh, so the main thing I want to convince you of is if you're building web apps, you're dealing with distributed systems, whether you like it or not. Um, and they're not really intense distributed systems, but uh, the reason I wanted to give this talk is because knowing about some of the solutions and problems that are, are involved in distributed systems is, um, I, it'll help you out a lot, because you'll know when you're hitting these boundaries of problems. Um, so anyway, onto Raft. And this, I, I wrote Paxos made understandable. And this is kind of a joke. It's probably, it's a lot to explain, but Paxos is an older consensus um, algorithm, and it was it was done in like the late seventies or early eighties or something. Um, it's a great it's a great algorithm, but it's really really difficult to understand. And there's like ten follow up papers that are all like Paxos made easy, Paxos made real time, and Paxos made performant. And so Paxos made understandable is kind of a joke, but that's basically what it is. It's uh, it's a bad joke. But uh, Raft is a new version of a consensus algorithm that was designed from the ground up to be understandable. And that's why I really like it and wanted to present on it. And uh, these two guys worked on it. Um, Derek Angario, I think, was the main developer behind it. Um, and I think this is his uh, teacher um, or other PhD person that he works with, uh, John Ousterhut. I, I don't know how I'm, if I'm saying that right, so sorry if I'm saying it wrong. but. Um, and if you if you don't know who that is, he's the guy who wrote like I think Tickle, like TCL. Um, I think is how you say that, uh, and some other cool stuff. So he's he's been there and done a lot of awesome stuff. The project they're working on is called Ram Cloud, and it's it has a lot of distributed components. And they were they were like, um, oh, we're going to need distributed consensus, but they didn't want to use Paxos because it's way too hard. So they wrote their own, um, and that's where all of this kind of came out of. But to get started, um, I just want to kind of formally, boringly define consensus. And so I kind of came up with this definition, kind of stole it from a couple of other places. But it's basically you have a bunch of servers, and you just want them to agree on something. 
uh, even though some of them might blow up or be isolated from each other. Um, so you basically just want to have servers agree on stuff, even though they can fail and do crazy stuff. And um, the way we do that is, if, you, if you've ever seen, um, if you've ever read about CAP theorem, it uh, stands for consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And it's sort of like the iron triangle of distributed systems, I guess more specifically distributed databases. Uh, so you can only pick two uh, kind of thing going on here. And uh, the way they achieve uh, the consistency part is, well, obviously they, they uh, leave out the availability piece. So we're sacrificing availability. And the, the way we're sacrificing it is since we're like voting on things to happen, if more half or more than half of the servers die, uh, you can't commit new, uh, you can't really interact with the system because it has to reach consensus. It's kind of, kind of makes sense, right? Um, so that's where this CP area on the graph. But. Cool, so, uh, so getting into how Raft is organized. Uh, there's three kind of main components to it. There's the big consensus module, which kind of holds all the logic for when to commit actions and uh, when to vote on, it, on things and what, who can do what. Uh, there's also a replicated state machine. Uh, that's gonna do, it's gonna take the actions in the log, which is the third component, and uh, run operations on them. And uh, the consensus module uh, is made up, there's three different roles that a node can be. So you can either be a leader, and there's only one leader Per term, I'll, I'll get into what term is later on. Uh, all of the other nodes are typically followers unless they're trying to become the leader, and in that case, they're the candidate. I'll, I'll show you guys more about this on the next slide. And uh, so, and then um, also one other thing to keep in mind is time is divided into terms. So we're not using timestamps to define um, actions. We're using these increasing numbers called terms. Um, I, I will also explain that more in depth on, on another slide. And we're only using two commands too, uh, request vote and append entries. And so request vote is what a candidate would send out if they want to want people to vote for them. And append entries is how logs get replicated out. Um, it's also overloaded for a heartbeat too, um, but I will explain that in depth as well on another slide. So back to these three types of nodes. Uh, so the leader. Uh, the leader is who you will talk to when you're trying to do stuff in this consensus system. Uh, it'll accept the commands from the clients uh, and figure out uh, when to commit those, or it'll basically figure out when to commit them and tell the other follower nodes that they should commit them locally. So it hands out like, or handles sending out all of the log entries and then also running them through the state machine. Um, also, it's continually telling everyone it's the leader uh, just so people know, and um, so followers don't, aren't continually trying to become the leader. So, and the other, the other part of the system, which most nodes are typically, typically gonna be a follower, uh, all they do is listen to the leader. They're like, hey, thanks for all these logs, and that's, that's basically all they do, but if someone's be trying to become a leader, they'll also vote for them. So, kind of a basic thing. They're also used for that consensus part as well. Uh, and then candidate, if a follower doesn't hear from a leader in a while. They're like really power hungry and they're like, oh, I wanna be the leader right away. So as soon as they don't hear from the leader in a certain amount of, a certain amount of time, they time out and switch straight to a candidate uh, and try to get people to vote for them right away. And just to make this more clear, so we have, your, we have our three states here. This is like a little state diagram. Uh, so, we can, so we start out with the follower. Uh, if, we, if we time out because we haven't heard from the leader, we'll switch to being a candidate. Um, and then either one of two things can happen. We can either win the election that we're running or we'll, the election will time out and we'll switch back to um, a, a new election. So we'll just like restart the election. And then uh, going back down to follower, uh, from a leader, if you discover a new leader, which basically if, if you hear of a leader with a higher term number, um, you'll step down as well back to a follower because someone else has Basically, you've timed out or something else has happened where someone else has been able to become a leader. Uh, and also, if you're a candidate and you have lost an election because maybe there were more than one candidates at the same time, uh, you'll also step down. So basic stuff. Uh, it's, it might be kind of hard to follow the graph, but I also have a, an example with uh, multiple nodes at the, um, towards the end that we can look through. 
Cool. And then so terms. Uh, so terms are, it's like this, um, I guess you can think of it as a version of time that only moves like one second every time you do something. Uh, so we're actually kind of using actions as time instead of time itself. Uh, and the reason, the reason for this is, uh, so e every time there's a new election, the term is incremented. And so we always know that there's um, only one leader at a time because uh, it, it, before you become a leader, you have to have incremented the term and you can only um, you can only become the leader with a higher term than other people. So it's kind of a way to make sure that we're always talking to the uh, most up to date leader. Um, but it's also kind of confusing. So it's it's pretty minor. You don't really need to get, I don't really need to get into depth of this. Um, I'll show you in an example of how the term changes and why it's important. So getting into a like best case scenario, the happy log entry example. So you have three servers, A, B, and C. Uh, a is the leader already, and B and C are just following A. And there's nothing in the log. Um, everything's at like kind of the uh, base, like this term term one, commit index zero. So everything's kind of just starting. Uh, and we talk to A, and we send it this star is our is, is my like way of representing a log entry. And A is like, cool, I'm gonna put that in my log. It's not, it's not committed yet, because the commit index is still zero. So you can think of it as like an array, and it hasn't actually executed that first log entry. And so as soon as A gets it, A goes out and sends it to B and C. Uh, and they go ahead and put it in their log as well. Um, again, they haven't committed it yet, and it's not actually, hasn't been accepted. So if you're the client, you would still be waiting to get a response from the leader. Cool, and so B and C, write that to their log, which is like a, it's like persistent storage. And then they'll send it back, they'll send back a uh, response to A saying, hey, we got your message and we went ahead and put it in our log, what, what should we do next? So A, a gets both of those um, replies, and in this case it's not really a big deal, um, but uh, there's a fur this, another case where it will matter. But um, this, is, this is the majority of followers, uh, because we only have two. Uh, and so A is like, cool, I got a majority, I, I wrote it to a majority of the followers, let me change my commit index. Um, so it, it changes the commit index, runs that log entry, um, so it's committed, I guess, and can't be, can't be revoked or anything later on. Um, and then it, it'll go and send that to B and C. Uh, and also at the same time, it'll, uh, it'll respond to the client that was initially trying to write that log entry, and uh, everything will be good. So. So that was the happy case. Now let's look at the next the next one where that uh, majority thing will uh, will make more sense. So the sad log entry example, we have the same the same setup, same exact state as the first example. Uh, we do the same thing where the client we send that star log entry to A, uh, it writes it to its log, and then uh, sends it out to both of the nodes. But this time you'll notice that C never actually gets the log entry. Only B wrote it down. Um, let's just say that uh, something happened to C and it can't, it's like the node went down or the network got cut. Uh, so basically someone just pulled the plug on that one. And so only B responds and A is like, well man, that sucks. Like, I can't actually do anything now. Uh, so it just, what it does is it just continually sends that log entry to C and, and and if there were more nodes, it would continually send them to send it to all the all the nodes until it got a majority of responses back. Um, and so eventually, C or some other nodes respond, uh, and it, they write it down to their log, and um, and then it, they would respond, and everything would just work. So that's kind of how it just kind of waits for a majority of nodes to respond before it commits those log entries. So here's a more uh, more interesting example, and this is where it really shines. Uh, so we have four nodes this time. Uh, a is still a leader. Um, we just added an extra node D that is in that initial state as well. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, the follower nodes, so B, C, and D, don't receive any word from A that it's still the leader. Uh, let's just say that someone pulled the plug on the A server and it's just down and it can't actually do anything. Uh, so uh, B, C, and D are just waiting until they time out, basically. Uh, B happens to time out first, and there is, there's a small thing here where um, they actually have 
sort of a random timeout timeout time to make sure that it doesn't happen at the same time, which is kind of nice. Um, it will probably wouldn't anyway, but it just kind of stops that from being more, uh, it lowers the probability of that. But uh, B times out first and immediately bumps its term and becomes a candidate. Uh, and then it goes ahead and sends out uh, vote requests to C and D. So it's like, hey, I haven't heard from A in a while. Do you guys wanna, want me to be the leader? And then uh, C and D, see that higher term number. So this is where the term comes into account. Um, but like for instance, if B had been in uh, some isolated node that hadn't talked to anyone in a long time and was still on like, uh, it was still on term one or something, they would be like, oh no, we don't, we don't want to talk to you. We want to talk to the higher term candidate. Uh, so they get the term, uh, it goes up to two, and then they respond to, to B and they're like, yeah, we'll vote for you. Uh, and since it's both of them uh, and, they're, and since there are only three other nodes, so uh, two would be a majority in this case. So B becomes the new leader and things just kind of keep happening like normal. Uh, and then we didn't have any log entries in this example, but uh, B would be able to send down log entries just like A did in the previous examples uh, once it's become the leader. And so it's, we, don't, we don't have to worry about like the split brain problem because worst case is uh, everything just comes to a grinding halt. Like let's say we, we have eight servers and we have a network partition that splits up four on one side and four on the other, um, no one's going to be able to get consensus. So no one's going to be able to continue writing these log, log entries. They're just going to be kind of waiting for the network partition to come back. So it's, um, we don't have to worry about like one of the hardest problems that can happen in a distributed system, which is really nice. Uh, but again, uh, the avail or we have to worry about availability, right? So like, uh, it's it's nice to have like more than three nodes or something because if uh, if like one of them goes down then you can't get a consensus or whatever so uh, so availability is a problem it's just it's good to know that that's what we're sacrificing also I guess I already mentioned this too so if, if more than half of the servers fail then you can't reach consensus and everything just kind of stops but one other weird thing to keep in mind is you can have uh, failed actions show up as actually committed later on. So let's say you're talking to the leader and you send it uh, a new log to commit uh, and the leader goes out and starts this whole thing where it's replicating and everything and right before it's sending that, or right before it's about to send you back the response that it was successful, that node just dies uh, and your client would just time out or something so it is kind of weird to, um, to think about that, but you might want to try to do idempotent actions or um, other things to make sure that you're, you know, like do, make sure you uh, check a field before you set a value in certain cases. So that is a little weird, probably not too big of a deal to worry about, but something that definitely happens. Um, two other cool things, the, the RAF paper, which is, it's a great paper, um, but two things that they specifically explain, um, which uh, are also really conf confusing and complex with Paxos, at least in my opinion. Uh, cluster changes, which means you can add a node uh, to an existing cluster, and it'll, um, instead of shutting everything down, like you might have to do with a Zookeeper or some of these other consensus uh, databases or consensus uh, systems, uh, you can basically add a node, and it'll do this cool thing where it, uh, it, it does consensus on its own to switch to a joint consensus, which is consensus of both of the old and the new cluster combined. And then so it gets consensus on that and then switches to just the new one and grabs and does consensus again. So there's no way that you can lose any data while you're transitioning. I, I, didn't, I don't have uh, in-depth slides to explain this, but read the paper, they explain it amazingly well. Uh, and also uh, they do log safety and uh, compaction. So, uh, it is hard to, um, once, once you have a big log, it's hard to do like garbage collection and stuff on it. Um, and they kind of bake that into the, uh, to the protocol. Also, um, things like if the leader dies, you wanna make sure that the next leader that you pick has the most up-to-date log in case, so you don't lose any um, operations or have to redo them in the process. Um, that again is also explained really well in the paper. So in things that you would use this for, uh, especially as a Rubyist, um, uh, and actually Google, Google has written, they didn't use Raft, but they wrote um, Chubby, which is, uh, I think it's, it was like four or five years ago, or maybe even more than that. Um, but they use it for a distributed lock server. Uh, a lot of people use Zookeeper for configuration management, which is another consensus 
uh, consensus system. Um, and so it would be a good, a good, a good way to like, like let's say you want to keep uh, configuration the same on all of your Rails apps and they're, and they're like distributed. Uh, it would be a really good way to do that without without having any problems across all of them. Also, this is a kind of interesting one, and I. Um, it would be nice if we didn't need Redis, and we just had a in-memory store on all of our worker nodes, and they just they just kind of figured it out on their own. So we, we didn't have this like external dependency of Redis when we're writing background jobs. But that's kind of a pet thing that I always wanted to do, like a little pro project, but I haven't actually had time to do it. But it would be cool if someone did, so you should, tr should try it out. Um, so here's the same question again. Like, why give this a, a Ruby users group? I, I kind of explained it before, like, um, you guys are already using distributed systems, but I also kind of wanted to give this talk just because uh, they're really cool. Like distributed systems and consensus are really interesting. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, I wish that more of us were kind of involved in academia. And so like I love Ruby and I used to go to college and I like a lot of us, but uh, I decided to write, I worked in this research lab, and I decided to write one of my projects in Ruby. And, um, and he, like, like, my professor, like, laughed at me. He's like, why would you do that? Like, why, why would anyone use Ruby? And so, I mean, and that really sucks. Like, Ruby, I, Ruby is really awesome at, like, taking really complex problems and, like, kind of presenting them in the, mo in the easiest form possible, uh, at least to me. So, um, so like, what can we do? Why why is this happening? Uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons, and I don't have like a bulletproof answer. Uh, but some of the things that we could focus on would be like, uh, I mean, community interest. So having Rubyists be more involved in academia and like really like it, and vice versa too. I don't know if any of you guys are teachers or in college still, but like telling your friends how cool Ruby is is like a, definitely a good way to start. Academia. Like uh, anyone in the uh, teaching or college area, I guess. So anyone, anyone getting a PhD, stuff, people like that. Yeah, people. I, a lot of the time too, people more focus on like uh, writing papers and uh, uh, new, like forward-looking things compared to like just implementing like applications and stuff that kind of can already be done. But um, so also too, uh, and this this one. This one's definitely important for this talk. Uh, I, I, it would be awesome if a lot of the people writing these papers and the people in academia really focused on understandability. So the reason I loved the RAF paper and hated all the other consensus ones is because I actually understood it. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's a way to get a lot of developers and other people interested in what you're actually doing if you Try to if you try to get them uh, if you try to make it so they can actually understand it and not just so these other people with PhDs can understand it. And just for an example too, like trying to read a paper, uh, the first paragraph you have to look up like three words in the dictionary, and then like then you get three paragraphs in, and you realize you've missed out on like five papers of context that they're referencing, and you're just I mean that sucks. Like no one you can definitely do that, but it's like really hard to gain anything useful out of it right away. Uh, so that's my, uh, I, I really just wish that papers were more understandable and kind of, they started with that premise instead of just this, here's this crazy thing that I learned. Um, and also, uh, there's there's not a lot of learning resources. Like, there's awesome books on learning Rails. Like, there's like 50 books on learning Rails. But learning uh, distributed systems, like, where do you even go to learn that? Um, there are a lot of papers on the topic, but a lot of the stuff isn't practical. So it would be awesome if once you learned this stuff and got really good at it, that you went out and gave talks and wrote books. Um, so what can you do, like right now, like when you leave or even before I'm done with my talk, uh, go read some papers. There's some really awesome ones, and they, some of them are kind of scary, but uh, you should really check them out. Like, oh, good. Where do you find these papers? So that was exactly what I was about to say. Uh, you can go on Google Scholar, and they have a lot of really popular papers, especially if you're interested in like specific topics like artificial intelligence or distributed computing. They have like a whole list of awesome papers. Um, there's also winners in each category every year of like the best papers submitted to, submitted to different conferences. Sometimes you have to pay for those depending on which uh, which university submitted them and stuff. Um, but for the most part, if they're really popular, they're usually free. Um, also, basic ones like the cap. There's like a cap theorem related paper. Uh, Google's MapReduce paper is a really good read. 
Amazon's Dynamo paper is really good too. Um, and all of those have some really cool practical information in them as well. That's true. Also, I know. Yeah, and I know a lot of the college libraries are open during the day too, even if you're not a student. So, like, you can go into Georgia State, like, from normal business hours during the week. Um, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, and, and this is it's something that's changing too. A lot of people don't put them behind a paywall anymore just because it's not important to them. So it's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, so after you read papers, then write some awesome code. It doesn't have to be like totally, um, it doesn't have to totally work, but just like write it and put it up on GitHub and share it with people because they might be interested in the same thing and it might really help them out or at least get other people interested in the same topic. That, that's actually, I, I looked up a bunch of Ruby code for that people have started writing Raft. Uh, and put it up on GitHub, and it was just really interesting to read through. Uh, and also, uh, give talks like I am. Like, go learn something really cool that no one else, or you don't think anyone else knows about, and then go and give a crazy talk on it. Uh, it's not easy, but uh, I, I just, I would really enjoy, like, really crazy out there talks. Um, anyway, so, uh, to give some credit to people, uh, this raft paper is amazing. You should go read it. If, if you've never read a paper in your entire life, you should try reading this one first because it's awesome. And just, it's still new too. Um, I think it was released either this year or last year, but they're continually revising it. Um, like there was a revision like two days ago. So very current. Um, and also go talk to Diego on Twitter. He's he's an awesome guy. I think his Twitter account's like on Gari, or on Gardi, I think is like what it, I, I, it's on another slide. Um, there's also his own Raft implementation in C++. Um, I haven't read through all of it, but it's actually pretty good C++ code if you're if you're into that kind of thing. There's also way way other um, or tons of other Raft implementations on GitHub and pretty much any language you'd ever want. Uh, so Ruby, I mean, pretty much anything. Uh, and there's also there's this really cool podcast uh, called Think Distributed. Uh, there's a couple of guys from Basho that started it, I think, and their first episode was on Raft, and they actually have uh, Diego on the show to to give a talk on it. Uh, so. That's all I really had, uh, but if anyone has any questions or if I didn't explain anything correctly or if you want to critique my talk, now's the time, tell me. So, anyone have anything for me? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, you said it's implementation of Paxos. So, uh, it's not exactly Paxos. Paxos is a little bit different. Um, they're both consensus protocols, so I might have misspoke when I said it's an implementation of Paxos. Uh, there's a couple of things that are different about Paxos. Uh, I think there's like three different roles and each server can be all of those at once. Um, and I think there are certain cases where it's more performant. Uh, doing these, uh, these leader changes all the time can be um, a little bit less performant. Uh, they, they do a different thing where they, there's like learners and acceptors and the acceptors have to uh, get consensus independently of each other. So you could basically have, um, you basically have two leaders at once, kind of both both getting consensus for a different value. Uh, where Raft, you'd have to like get one, or one leader would have to do it, and then you'd have to wait for the next leader to get it. But it's still pretty quick. Um, the main problem with Paxos is it's not all of that stuff isn't, like the implementation details aren't defined in the paper. So it's really hard to say exactly uh, what a Paxos system is outside of just that theoretical piece of it. Um, so like actual, timeouts and all these different variables and like how you generate those terms, uh, what they call them, I forget what they call them in Paxos, but they're all, they're all different. So depending on which paper you're reading for that information, it might be different, I guess. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Can you give us a concrete example of like a web app pattern problem that you think would be awesome to solve for the distributed system of consensus? Uh, so the, the, the one that like I guess Rubyist probably hit the most is if you have you have some client that has like a huge database and uh, they don't want the database to ever like be down for an extended amount of time. So you have a hot swap database uh, in case that one server goes down. Uh, what a lot of people do is they just, um, 
as soon as they realize that database is down, like as this other one does, as soon as this other database realizes it's down, they'll go ahead and just like kill the other one, um, or at least it, if it's not already dead, try to kill it. Uh, and so consensus, consensus is really good, at least from the app level, to know, to safely um, kill off that old, at least the old database or one that's not, no longer responding and switch to a new one um, without like losing any data or having some weird partition. Um, it's not a really good example with just two databases. If you had like one database and like four hotspot backups, that would probably be a better example. But So what are they voting on? Like, we set, like, oh, it's leader election. So they're voting on like who is going to take over. Okay, which one is the master? Yeah, and so the main problem is like if you have a network partition, <clears throat> if you have a network partition and uh, two servers think that they should be the next leader, um, there's a lot of the time if you're not using consensus, they can they can split up and then and then you can never convert your data back because they're both still accepting new data, right? Which would be really bad. Like, what if you change your password once over here and then change it again and then went to the other like set of servers? Uh, you would never be able to know which one happened first or second. Uh, it would be a, it, it can get really gnarly. But basically, where eventual consistency will not work, and you need more of a you need to have something that is a system of record. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, single authoritative or, or you source. Know it Do you know if any of this is used in, like, say, Bitcoin? Uh, or is so, there a relationship there with those types of systems? There are similarities. I know Bitcoin uses, um, it, do, it does do, like, it doesn't do a full consensus because that would be insane. <laughs> uh, but it does verify transactions with other nodes. Um, I don't know the details there, though. I'm, I'm not an expert on Bitcoin. I'm pretty sure that they're doing distributed hash tables. Okay, okay, cool. Do, do you know, like, how they decide uh, what value is correct? Because like, I, I, I know I know it's... Um, Know all the details. Okay, me, me either. I know it's it's still susceptible to like the Byzantine generals problem. It's based around distributed hash tables to do that. Okay. Okay, cool. That's I should there's probably a paper on that that you should read as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh go ahead. I think in Bitcoin, it's actually. Uh, I mean, not in like the literal Bitcoin. Like you said, yeah. 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 Is it like pretty much saying, like, okay, there's a consensus that this is a legitimate Bitcoin? Yeah. The, you still need to have the leader and then you go to the next one, and then it's going to end, and then you get to verify each and every one until one Bitcoin is not responding, that would be a legitimate Bitcoin. Possible that pass that. Right, yeah, I think it's it's more, yeah, it's the same thing, just more with, like, or verifying the transaction. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know the details, though, so I'm probably, I hope I'm not saying something wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little bit different, um, because you can't get consensus of the whole system, because that would take, like, an extremely long time. All right, anyone else? Oh, okay. The thing that came to mind to me was oh. iCloud, and the com complications that it has in achieving consensus. And yeah. it's based on, you know, the cloud is the is the deciding. You know, that's for your master all the time. In this system it's like if you had a system like that, but any of those nodes could become that. That's, that, that's a good point. Yeah. So one thing that's the that consensus is not good for too is you don't want to use it like to store everything. Um, it's 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 a little bit slower than like a normal database. Um, but there are cool instances like uh, uh, Datomic, which is the guy who wrote Closure, started a database as well. They do this cool thing where you write up data, or you write up uh, data, and that's not that doesn't go through the consensus system. Uh, that, that's just like writing; it's like a key value store. But then they take that key that you get, and they um, they like swap that out using consensus. Uh, and so that's a really cool case where you can always write new data, but um, then the uh, the really the part where you need the uh, consistency. You're just doing a really minor operation, so I, I thought that was a really cool way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Other than the leader having the most recent log entry, are there other heuristics that are used in the leader and the clients or the camps like counselors to verify their information? Uh.
so there's there are certain heuristics. Um, one of them is you you never vote for someone that has that you have a more up to date log than. So like if you have more information, you're gonna you're not gonna expect you're not gonna respond to that candidate's vote request. Um, Which, I mean, if your term is higher than the right. candidate leader, then you don't vote for that candidate. That as well too. So but yeah, term term and the log are different though. Um, so the that's definitely like that's a, probably an easier case to um, reason about, where you won't vote for someone that's still operating in a lower term, um, and actually you'll probably tell them, "Hey, this has already happened. You need to like update." With the log entry, you're still both like valid candidates, um, although they don't even like the candidate who's who has a crappy log entry or log. It doesn't have all the log entries. Uh, they're not going to know that they're the only one. They're not going to know that they don't have the most up-to-date log. So. It works out really well with, with uh, the voting because if you're not voting for that person, eventually, the, eventually you'll time out and, and uh, try to get other people to vote for you. And, and in that case, they'll be like, "Oh, well, you have the better log. I'll vote for you then." Um, also, there are there are certain things with I can't remember exactly how they how they play into it, um, but depending on uh, there's certain response times uh, and other requirements that. You're not going to vote for someone if they have like a really crappy response time to one of your um, one of your requests or whatever. So, I, go read the paper. There's like a whole section on making it more performant. But does, does that answer the question? Or <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Okay. How would you actually use it from Ruby? From Ruby? Um, the raft term? There's there's not really there are raft implementations. I don't I don't know how um, how complete they are yet. Uh, Using it from Ruby today is probably really hard. You probably have to write a lot of stuff on your own. You could definitely use Zookeeper today, which is very similar. Um, and then in that case, you would just have a Ruby gem that I think I think in that case uh, speaks uh, protocol buffers or something, um, some some kind of network traffic as a client. Um, but a lot of the server is actually written in like C and C++ and stuff. I, Zookeeper is written in Java. Nice. Yeah, I think that's in Go, right? Or yeah, yeah. So that, that's another good example. I bet they probably are using it from Ruby too for configuration management. Anyone else? Cool. All right. Well, if you have anything that you want to tell me later, like that I need to improve, talk to me at the bar. That might be easier. But all right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>